when he came to his world, he came to teenage husband and wife. He came to shepherds in the field, to a land ruled by distant emperor and an appointed king. He came to a land in political turmoil, a religion filled with schisms, and a people racially segmenting. He came to outcast lepers and elitist priests, to men and women and children, just trying to get through one more day. He came to call them to a choice, a choice to be his people, the people of God. This is the Gospel of Matthew. Well, good morning. Hope you are doing well. That is Kirk Allen, and he's gonna kill me. This is our new tech director who's been here with us, who does an awesome job. He and Robert Allen and, and all these guys who work back there do such a great job. He hopes you never see him again, but we were having a little bit of, of iPad trouble this morning, which he, he came and helped me fix. All right, if you got a Bible this morning, Matthew chapter three. Matthew chapter three, we are going to look at the story of the man that Jesus called the greatest man who ever lived. Uh, if Jesus calls you the greatest man who ever lived, we have stuff from, to learn from this guy, right? Uh, I'm gonna introduce you, maybe if you've never heard the Bible before, I'm gonna introduce you to somebody. Uh, if you know the Bible kinda well, you've heard of this guy. And if you know the Bible really well, uh, this is still one of the most under-taught guys in Scripture. His name is John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a character in the Bible who precedes Jesus. Uh, he's so in tune with Jesus that the third person to know who Jesus was, first is Mary, who God said, you're pregnant with a baby by the Holy Spirit. Second was Joseph, who was like, I don't know about this pregnant by the Holy Spirit story, and then had God dreams every day for the next five years, apparently. And third was John the Baptist. You're like, he did? Yes, when he was a baby in the womb. Uh, if, you wanna, if you wanna have any argument about the personhood of the unborn, considered that when Mary uh, met Elizabeth, John's mother, and said, yes, we're having a baby boy, his name is Jesus, the baby leapt in her womb. Uh, this man was born to be in tune with the Spirit. He was born to be the forerunner. Now, what is the forerunner? Well, we'll get to that. So, John, if, we, if you were with us uh, last week when we talked about Jesus being the true and better Moses and talking about one of the most horrific stories in the Bible matched uh, with Pharaoh in the Old Testament killing the, the children of Israel uh, the story we looked at last week was King Herod killing the boys in Bethlehem, trying to kill the king. It's this story that Matthew tells, trying to show his very Jewish audience, Jesus is the true and better Moses. Well, the next story he tells is about John the Baptist. And if Jesus was the true and better Moses, we're gonna watch John play the true and better Aaron, the first high priest, the true and better Elijah, the great prophet of Israel, uh, and the uh, true and better Abraham. Uh, if you know your Bible, you know that Abraham is the great patriarch of Judaism. He is born when his parents, who are way too old to have children, have a miracle child. Uh, they are uh, 90 and uh, uh, 80 and just older, and they cannot have children, but they have one. Our story picks up uh, in Luke, uh, actually. Matthew uh, has just John just appears out of nowhere, just this mystery guy. Luke actually is the one who tells us his backstory. Uh, in Luke chapter one, it says, in the day of, days of Herod, king of Judea, that's the Herod that killed the baby boys in Bethlehem, there was a priest named Zechariah, of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So he's a priest, which means he's of the line of Aaron, and his wife is from the line of Aaron, which means they are Levites. The Levites are the priests of Israel. But to serve as a priest in the temple, you had to be descended from Aaron. 
Only the guys who are descended from Aaron could work in the temple. So this is a very priestly family. Uh, They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in age. A very uh, polite biblical way of saying they were old, y'all. They are old. And uh, Zechariah gets his one time in his life that he actually gets to go into the temple and, and care for some of the things inside the temple. Uh, there were so many of these guys by then that you got drafted by lots and you may get one time in your life that you actually got to go into the temple and do your job. When he does, the Lord appears to him and says, you're gonna have a kid and you're gonna name him John. And he says, there's nobody in my family named John. And the, spirit, the angel of the Lord goes, well, you know what? How about you don't talk anymore? And so he can't talk the whole time that John is in utero and he's born. And uh, Elizabeth says, we're supposed to name him John. And all the people go, she is just giving birth uh, in a chair for 27 hours. She's crazy. We're, there's nobody in your family named John. And he gets a piece of like he gets a, a, an old fashioned whiteboard, which is just rock, and he just writes on it, and he says, his name is John. And then he could talk again, and he just said, thank you, Jesus, because he knew not to say anything else. He's like, I'm not talking anymore. This is John. So John the Baptist in Matthew just appears. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Uh, so John just appears here. Now, I need to fill in some blanks because there's several things uh, that are going on here that you're gonna need to know about. One is because Zechariah and Elizabeth are very old, uh, we can surmise they probably died very early in John's life. John is supposed to be one of the temple priests. He's supposed to be one of those guys in the temple doing the job He is supposed to be there for all the holy days, doing the job of Aaron, doing the job of all the Pharisees and Sadducees we see in the New Testament and in the Gospels. That's where he's supposed to be, but he's not. He's not even in a town somewhere. He's not even ministering to people in official Israel. He has gone out in the wilderness. And if we get to meet people in heaven, this is a dude I'm gonna cook chicken wings for and be like, I need to hear the whole story because there's no way these people this old having a baby doesn't make every person everywhere in their circle of friends go, it's just like Abraham and Sarah. It's just like Abraham and Sarah. This is, they probably thought this dude was the Messiah, was the one who was to come. Uh, another baby, another miracle baby in the same way that Abraham and Sarah had their son, this is a miracle baby. He probably heard it every day of his life. You're the miracle baby. You're the one. And he doesn't join them in being the one. And he doesn't say, yeah, I am the one. Y'all should, y'all, y- let's go, let's do this. By the time he's around 31, 32, somewhere about the same age Jesus is. Jesus and he are cousins, by the way. He's out in the wilderness. He's out in the wilderness, uh, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. He's by the Jordan River. There's nothing there. He is out there. And in those days, John the Baptist came preaching, saying, repent, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Uh, The first thing you need to to get about John the Baptist is he's going to come in, and from the other gospels, we know a little bit of his story, what happens to him. He comes in, and he almost immediately gets into it with the king in the north of Galilee, who we talked about uh, last week, named Herod Antipas. He instantly gets into it with her. Uh, especially he uh, and Herod Antipas's wife. Uh, Herod Antipas had married his brother's wife when he had a sketchy divorce and she had a sketchy divorce and they married each other. This is so weird. His name is Herod and her name was Herod Eus, Herodias, that was her name. Like, would you date somebody? You're like, my name's Greg. My name's Greg Eus. Let's date. No, there's no way, no. 
That's never, uh-uh, it's never gonna happen, never gonna happen. This dude made, she was like married to her uncle, named for Herod the Great, a daughter who then marries his son, who's also named Herod. This is weird. This whole thing's weird. And John the Baptist comes out, guns blazing. This is an improper marriage. You are both adulterers. You should be stoned to death. John the Baptist has no tact. He does not care. Why? He lives in the wilderness. He is out there. He has been surrounded by people his whole life going, you're the miracle baby. And he rejects it all to go live in the wilderness and he says the straight fire, right? He does not care about your feelings. Uh, One day, the Pharisees come out to be baptized by him and to repent. And he says to them, this is what he says to them, like any good pastor would say, when people are coming, we wanna follow God, we wanna get baptized. He goes, who told you to come out here and repent? Ugh, he's mad at them. He wants them to stay condemned. Like literally goes, ugh, who's gonna waste water on these dudes? Who told the dogs to come out? He just goes at them. This dude is crazy, right? I love him so much. He comes out preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Other gospels will say the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, same sort of thing. Here's what you wanna know. If I asked a modern audience, what was Jesus's message while he walked around preaching on the earth? 90% of people are gonna say, God loves you. Jesus's preaching message ministry was going out and proclaiming, God loves you, and I'm here to show you God loves you. That was not Jesus's message. Jesus's message is the exact same as John's message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. At hand in Hebrewism meant right now. It's in your hand. It's right now. It's not in the future. It's not going to be. It's in your hand right now. And if uh, that sounds familiar, uh, it's Jesus' preaching. Uh, All three of the the synoptic gospels, the synoptic gospels are the gospels that all follow about the same story, Matthew, Mark, Luke. They see with one eye, sin, optic, synoptic gospels. They all say this. And for the Jewish audience, this is crazy because they are the kingdom of God. They've been taught their whole lives. They are the kingdom. We are Jews. We are Israel. We are God's chosen people. We are the kingdom of God. And he comes to them and he says, repent. Which repent is a church word which we all know, but we don't fully grasp what it says. The Greek is meta noeo, meta noeo. You know the word meta, which means huge, above, overarching, big thing. And the word means to change your mind. To fundamentally change your mind. Repentance means that you saw things one way and now you see them a totally different way. It was also used to mean turn around and walk the other way. That's what repentance is. Repentance is not, oh, I'm really sorry that I sinned again, Jesus. I'll do better next time. And you have no intention of it. That's not repentance. Repentance is not sorrow. Repentance is not guilt. Although the Bible tells us godly sorrow produces repentance. Repentance is I am walking the other way. And if we don't fundamentally understand that message, we do not understand the message that Jesus primarily taught while he was on the earth. He we don't understand the message that Jesus taught while he was on the earth. It is the central message. Jesus will send his disciples out, right? So the apostles come and he eventually goes, okay guys, I've been teaching you for a year now. It's time for you to go do what I've been teaching you to do. I want you to go out and I want you to go preach to every village and every place you come to. If they won't receive you, shake the dust off your feet, which means curse them and go to the next village. What message did they teach when they went out? 
Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. When the Holy Spirit falls on the disciples on Pentecost, and Peter preaches the very first ever crucified and resurrected Lord, he preaches a message about repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. When Paul is speaking in Athens to all the Greek scholars and all the Greek religious people, he says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You catching a, a drift here? A gospel message that doesn't center itself in repent for the kingdom of God is at hand is not a biblical message. If the gospel you learned is only God loves you, he's gonna make your life great. You didn't hear Jesus' messages or the disciples or Paul's. You didn't hear it. John the Baptist is as if the law of God had come to life and was living out in the desert, ruthlessly confronting people with their sins because that's what the law does. There is no gospel without law. There is no gospel without law. When you read Romans, <laughs> the first two and a half chapters are condemnation. This is how Gentiles have sinned. This is how Jews have sinned. This is how every person alive has sinned. Because you can't get to grace if you don't understand that you need it. You will never reach for a life preserver if you are convinced you aren't drowning. Before Jesus can show up, the Bible said a forerunner would appear. He would show up and he would call the, father, the sons to their fathers. How does he do that? By showing them that they have sinned. The Jews thought they were the kingdom of God. The shocking part was that they thought the Gentiles were out. John the Baptist is telling them, you got a bigger problem than this. In Matthew chapter three, verse three, he says, for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. It goes on, it says, lay every hill low, build every valley up, smooth it out, the, the Lord is coming. In antiquity, uh, in almost every culture in antiquity, if the sovereign, uh, if your king or queen was coming to your village, the first thing that village would do is start repairing their roads. They wanted to make sure their roads were smooth for the king's entry so that he wouldn't charge them with not taking care of his country. So this is what he's calling on. It's time for you to prepare yourself for the king's arrival. And the way we're gonna get everything for the king, ready for the king's arrival is we are going to level you out. How do we level you out? In terms of the gospel, we bring you to the place where you know you need repentance. Repentance is the first gift of God to you for your salvation. It is the economy of God that we would say, God will never do anything to hurt my feelings. The actual God goes, let me show you who you are to me so that you will know how much you need the gift he's gonna offer you in the next second. It's the only way we will cling to grace is realizing we have no other choice. Uh, and one of the more mystifying, especially now, uh, it, this sounds like an episode of Fear Factor or one of those shows that used to be on, right? Uh, John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Uh, my dog subscribed to this diet when all the cicadas were running. She'd be like, these are good. And then like an hour later, no, they're not. <laughs> they're not. Uh, why are they claiming this about John? Uh, is, is it just like random fact? Is it like, we love to talk about the sartorial choices of the prophets of Israel. Sorry, that means the dressing choices of Israel. Uh, we don't know. Maybe he liked camel hair. Maybe he just wore it all the time, right? Maybe somebody just likes blue checked shirts and y'all need to get over it. Maybe that's what's going on. Sorry if you're new to fellowship. That's very, that's the inside baseball right there. 
That's the deep magic right there. Uh, no, the reason that this verse is in here is because it matches the exact description of Elijah in 2 Kings. Uh, they answered him, this is the king asking, who is this who told you to leave? He wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather around his waist, and he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. It's an exact reference to Elijah. Why is the gospel author trying to prove that John the Baptist is Elijah? Well, in Israel's history, they had prophets continually showing up, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. The greatest of these prophets was Elijah. Uh, if you will remember your New Testament, if you know the story, once time Jesus takes his three boys and they go up on a mountain and he is turned into the radiance of God and they see him as he is and they see two men with him, Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. Uh, when Paul in Romans chapter three, verse 21 uh, says a righteousness from God has been revealed and the law and the prophets bear witness to it. He's referencing that moment. Moses is the law, Elijah are the, is the prophets. Elijah may be, uh, there may be one other dude, eh, uh, is the only man who never died. He is the only man who never died. Why? Because a great chariot swang low, sweet chariot, and it came forth to carry him home. That's, that's the prayer of, I wanna be like Elijah. I don't wanna see death. I just wanna be taken to your kingdom. Uh, when Jesus is walking around, when John the Baptist is walking around, they're going, are you Elijah brought back from heaven? Uh, but the reason they really did this is because they're continually prophets in Israel until, uh, until Malachi. Malachi is the last prophet who speaks to Israel. It's 400 years of silence. And the last thing that Malachi says to them is this, the Lord speaking to Israel, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before great, uh, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And sure enough, he sends John the Baptist, who Jesus said, if you're willing to hear this, he was the Elijah who was to come. And those who accepted him have their home in heaven, and those who rejected him do not. And not only that, but within a generation of Jesus and John the Baptist, Jerusalem, Israel, totally destroyed. Totally destroyed. He did exactly what he said he would do. John the Baptist is the Elijah. He's out in the wilderness preaching. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. The people under Judaism were taught both as a religious message and just a cultural notion. It's the same cultural notion that every people group have and every religious people have and even Christians have who won't listen to the gospel. They are taught, justify yourself before God. Do the right things, offer the right sacrifices, do everything you're supposed to do and you will justify yourself to God. John doesn't teach them that. He says, not justify yourself to God, confess your sins to him. Confession in the Greek says, means to speak the same thing. Say the same thing. That's what the word confession means. It means to sit down with God and say the same thing about your heart and your sin that he is saying about your heart and your sin. Speak the same. Admit he's right. The remedy to sin is not to hide it, but admit it to speak it out. When it says Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region were coming to the Jordan, that's everybody. This dude had crowds of people coming out every day trying to hear from him. Not only that, but we learn in the book of John, that's John the apostle, not the Baptist, that all the Galileans were coming there too. In fact, it is where Jesus met most of his apostles. When he was circulating those, he came and he found his people. You're like, no, he didn't. He found them on a beach. And he said, come follow me. I'll make you fish as a And that's not what happened. 
He clearly met them while John was baptizing, and then he disappears for 40 days to go be tempted by the devil in the desert. And those dudes go, what are we gonna do now? John gets arrested, they go home. They're back in their lives. And then one day that dude shows up on the beach. Come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. It's not some stranger. It's the dude they'd sat around a campfire with and he explained all of Judaism to them. What you probably don't know about the Bible because it's, it's these random little paragraphs in the New Testament is that John the Baptist's disciples and Jesus' disciples got into arguments all the time. Lots of conflict between them. The first one is Jesus, after he's baptized by John, starts preaching around the same area that John is, and then everybody starts going to Jesus. And John's disciples, John's boys, come up to him and they go, hey, you remember the dude that you were with and were like, he's awesome? He's getting all the people now. We should probably go stop him. This, this is our gig. And John turns on them and he says, they found out what everybody else felt like. They're like, I'm John's boy. He'll never do it to me. He turns on them and goes, morons. <laughs> he says, the bride is waiting on the groom. And when the groom appears, the bride will go to him. The best friend of the groom is just happy it's happening. He goes, he points at him down that river and goes, he must increase and I must decrease. And if you wanna know what your Christian walk is, that's it. He must increase but I must decrease. Her John doesn't stop talking about Herod and he doesn't stop talking about Herodias. When Elijah shows up out of the middle of nowhere in Kings, he instantly gets into it with a king named Ahab and his wife, Jezebel. Jezebel hates this dude and she wants him dead and does everything possible to kill him. John the Baptist shows up, he gets into it with a king named Herod and his wife wants him dead. He's basically called her a harlot in front of everyone and she wants him dead, but Herod's scared. Herod is scared of him. Uh, Herod arrests him, for Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared for the people because they held him to be a prophet. He's gonna arrest him to shut him up, but he's not gonna do anything else because he's scared of the people. He's a little scared of John too. And then Herodias has an idea. I'll get my daughter, uh, how do I say this? Because I know there's kids in the room, to make a TikTok for him and he says, I'll give you anything. And she says, I want his head on a silver platter. And he's trapped because he said it in public. So he kills John. John is in prison and he knows he's going to die. Not only is he the one who had said, he must increase, I must decrease. Not only is he the one who says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist was in prison and he knew he was going to die because a weak man had watched this girl. And so he writes Jesus a letter. He writes Jesus a letter, and I need you to feel that letter. I'm the miracle baby. I'm the miracle baby. And I heard your voice and I went and lived in the wilderness and I wore ratty clothes and I ate one thing and I lived in the desert and I'm in a cell and I'm gonna die and you are supposed to be the Messiah who comes and saves us and I don't know what's going on. And he says, are you the one to expect or should we have expected another? Did I waste it? Did I waste my life? I'm the miracle baby. Did I do it wrong? Did I waste my life? This is what Jesus says. Now when John heard about the deeds of the Christ, he sent words by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered then, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. 
and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended by me. Was it enough for John? Did John go that night when Herod ordered his head cut off? Did he die in despair or did he die rejoicing? I hope rejoicing, I don't know. But John was a human being and guess what? John was the blind. Even though as a baby he jumped for Jesus. John was lame. Even though he told people to follow him, he said, I'm not worthy to wear his sandals. I'm not worthy to wash his feet. He was the leper. He was the outcast. And John the Baptist, being fully human, was a sinner, and John was the dead, and so are you. And if this start of this sermon made you despair to wonder, have I been sorry enough? Have I repented enough? Did I do it right? I want to remind you of a miracle baby. I want to remind you of a man who grew up in social circles where everyone told him, you are the one. A man who served Jesus, a man who watched the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus and still came to a point in his life where he said, did I waste it? Did I waste my life? Believe that grace is bigger than your sin. Believe the gospel is greater than your failure. Believe the gospel can come to you in the darkest cell, in the darkest place, in your darkest moment, and say to you, Blessed are you if you don't lose faith in me. Don't look at what you see. Look at what I do. John never saw the cross. He never saw the resurrection except in heaven. Seated with the angels, singing their songs and watching the victory that bought his redemption and yours. He was the forerunner, not just of Jesus, but of us of the people who believe and fail and fall and are forgiven by his grace as a gift. Amen? You better amen that. Will you pray with me? Our Father God, your prophecy to your servant Malachi said, I will call the hearts of the children to their fathers. And that's us. That's your elect, those you have called out. You have called your children's heart to their father. And let us trust Jesus' famous story where the son who had wished his father was dead, who had run off and spent his inheritance, who had lived in revelry and sin and debauchery, Realize maybe I can go back to my father's house as a slave only to be welcomed with open arms, loving arms, adorned. But the story's not just about the prodigal, it's also about the older brother who did everything right, who did everything right, was everything his father wanted and yet couldn't understand why his father was welcoming the other child home. Because the father welcomed them both. Come and join the party. It doesn't matter where you are this morning, the gospel is greater than your failure. It's greater than your need. It's greater than the day you questioned or even didn't believe in what you previously said you had. There's always a path back. Thank you, Father, that there is always a path back through the wilderness, through the water, to the mountain, to the throne. Praise you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray, amen.